Program number 71. Three, two, one. I'm interviewing Devon Woodland, president of the National Farmers Organization. We're talking about the discussion in the news concerning $600 million in emergency loan funds from the FMHA, the Fe Farmers Home Administration, to farmers and ranchers. Devon, what's at stake? Well, Phil, the irony in this whole issue is, is that Congress has appropriated uh, $600 million for direct emergency loan through the FMHA program. And the Department of Agriculture has uh, chosen to share that responsibility with the commercial banks. Now, we think this is unfair because it puts the banker in a position to where he now has the ability to make a decision as to whether or not that individual farmer uh, stays in business, whether he has the capital needed for operating uh, his farm in the, in the spring. And the original intent, oh, wasn't it, that the FMHA was to be a last resort? Well, who would decide if it's merely a government guarantee to the commercial banks? Well, the banker, unfortunately, would have that, uh, that decision-making power. And uh, it appears to us that their record is not too good over the years. Uh, cronyism uh, fits in or some uh, preferential treatment for customers which they may have some uh, allegiance or perhaps they may feel that uh, their loan is uh, not secure enough and so they get the government then to back that loan in that bank. And we'd like to see uh, all $600 million be direct loans from FMHA as was originally intended by Congress uh, the monies have been appropriated for that purpose, and uh, we think that it's uh, uh, just misdirection to allow those monies to go into a commercial bank for lending purposes. Now, at your direction, didn't farmers and ranchers let their congressmen know about this when it was in a conference committee? Yes, uh, the Senate has uh, worked on it in one session, but we think that it ought to be 100 percent FMHA. And so uh, we're asking our people to contact their congressman and explain to him what they would like to have done. And I think we're going to see an overwhelming majority of farmers and ranchers that feel the same as we do, that the commercial banks uh, should not have any part of this action. Devon Woodland, president of NFO. He discussed an administration proposal to cut back on an already authorized $600 million in emergency loan funds to go direct from the FMHA to farmers and ranchers. The administration wanted most of that money to be merely federally guaranteed loans by the banks to the farmers, with the bankers deciding who gets what. And Woodland noted the NFO is against that. I'm Phil Allen for Here's Info. And that for today is something to think about. Number 72, three, two, one. Wayne Kreitz, you remember, is the Missouri farmer who called national news attention to the plight of grain growers whose commodity was stored in a bankrupt elevator. He served a little time in jail for taking his grain out of one. He makes a joke about this in a speech at a farm unity meeting at Yuma, Colorado, co-hosted by the NFO and the AAM. Here are some highlights. Wayne Kreitz is telling about agriculture's losses. If there's anything at all to concern the American people in this country, it is that we're losing the most productive industry in the world, the industry that produces the food for this nation. And you know, when we look at the economic conditions that our country's in, and if we can get the people to understand that agriculture is the industry that can bring this country out of the depression that it's going into. You know, they tell us that we got 2.3 million farmers left, and that we're losing over 3,000 farmers a week in this country. Do you realize out of this 2.3 million farmers, how many wore out cars, trucks, combines, tractors, on and on and on that that represents. And if that American farmer was making a profit, we'd be replacing those and we'd put the people back to work in this country. At another point, Kreitz talked about parity and how agriculture's success affects the whole economy. You know, the USDA uses the word parity as a yardstick of what we should be receiving for our agriculture products. We've been averaging about 50% of parity. Do you realize what would happen to this nation if we doubled agriculture prices to the farmers? Think of the billions and billions of dollars of new wealth that would be generated out there on the farm. 
One dollar in agriculture generates seven others through the economy. Just the tax revenue off of this new wealth. You know, we could rebuild our roads and bridges. We can finance our schools. We can carry on with our needed social programs. And of course, I'm one individual who'd hope we'd have enough money left to build some new jails and new prisons. Because I tell you, I'd certainly appreciate a nice new clean jail once in a while. <laughs> but that's what agriculture can do. It can put this country back to work. And what would it cost the consumer if we doubled the price of wheat? It cost him less, less than a nickel a loaf. What a small price to pay to keep that independent family farmer on the farm. And some of Wayne Kreitz's ideas on working together. Ladies and gentlemen, if we were just willing and get enough people to get involved with the NFO grain block, we could get the price to put this nation back on its feet. If we could get enough people involved in the American agriculture movement and working in their political arena, we're beginning to block those votes. Does that sound familiar? See, that's how you do things. And it takes people working together with coalitions. At a Farm Unity meeting co-hosted by the NFO, Wayne Kreitz of Missouri spoke at one at Yuma, Colorado, where we got these highlights. I'm Phil Allen for Here's Info, and that for today is something to think about. Number 73, 3, 2, 1. The problem of nitrogen levels in the water supply, both for livestock and for human consumption, is known to exist in many parts of the United States. We got an informed description of the problem and some possible legislative solutions recently when we interviewed Mike Dennis of Lincoln, executive director of the Nebraska Water Conservation Council. When Here's Info covered the annual conference of the Nebraska Organic Agriculture Association, Mike was asked to speak from the floor about a proposal pending in the Nebraska Unicameral. We asked Mike to tell us about it. The question had to do with the recognition that we have a serious and increasingly widespread nitrate contamination problem in our groundwaters and that this problem is going to become much worse simply because it takes many times many years for uh, nitrates to reach our groundwaters. There's a bill pending in the unicameral, 426, uh, introduced by uh, Senator Chris Beitler of Lincoln. And this is, uh, I think, the third time he's introduced the measure that would uh, attempt to give the local NRDs the planning and uh, uh, regulatory ability to begin to deal with this problem. And that it's time to quit digging in our heels and ignoring it, that it will just get worse and we need some action and we, uh, we need a framework to deal with it. NRDs, now these are natural resources districts in Nebraska? Right. Let's talk to other states now about the same question. How widespread is this problem and is it being dealt with in other states at the legislative level? You'll find that this problem is widespread throughout the Midwest and primarily where you do have uh, the use of uh, nitrogen type fertilizers so that uh, Minnesota, Iowa and spreading across the Midwest, I know they have a problem in East, southeastern South Dakota, uh, they have, do have these problems, and they're becoming increasingly serious everywhere. Mike Dennis, you've worked with problems like this having to do with water before, state legis before the Nebraska Unicameral. Are you optimistic? I'm very optimistic. Uh, in fact, I know Chris Beitler, the uh, sponsor of this measure, is optimistic. In the floor debate that's occurred so far, there's a recognition that there is a problem and that we do need to deal with it and that's a significant state, uh, step forward for the state and for the legislators especially in agricultural areas who've had some uh, uh, fears about this this type of approach so I'm very optimistic and uh, I think we're making some very constructive headway to dealing with the problem. Since that interview Mike Nennis pointed out to me that part of the solution recognition of the problem by resources districts has been accomplished and other measures are being considered I'm Phil Allen for NFO's Here's Info, and that for today is something to think about. Number 74, 3, 2, 1. A hearing was held in Washington, D.C. this past fall to look into the spreads between the prices hog producers get compared to wholesalers of pork. 
and also looking at the spread revealed in comparison of wholesale pork and retail pork. Kathy Morrison, here's Info Consumer Reporter, is with me today to talk about these findings of the House Agriculture Committee. Tom Harkin of Iowa chaired the hearing because he's head of the subcommittee on livestock, dairy, and poultry. Kathy, will you explain what they found? First, a quote from Harkin's summary. Examination of price spreads for pork contains information which I find to be quite startling. For example, from 1970 to 1982, the farm value of pork increased 124 percent, but only 40 plus percent was the wholesale increase in the same 12 years. Okay, what was happening to the retail level from 1970 to 82? It went up 283 percent. Wow, how come? Well, retailers put the price tags on, don't they? Yes, and they price what they have to sell high enough to cover mounting costs. And one can't help noticing that this was a period of time, all during the 1970s, when prices of most everything were going up. But it still doesn't explain a 283% jump in retail compared to a mere 40% jump in wholesale. I've got a theory. What's your theory? Well, there were some mergers of wholesale and retail, so it's hard to make a clear distinction. And in either case, these were business operators who know how to put the price tag on. The Congressional Subcommittee also found a surprising trend of very recent months. The wholesale to retail spread went up 27.5%, and inflation was not a factor. Proving that when a supermarket wants to up the price, it can do so. What do the price of hogs have to do with all this? We asked Merle Sunken, head of the NFO Hog Division, to describe the situation the hog farmer faced during that same decade of the 1970s. Well, the industry changed a great deal. There was a growing use of confinement setups. There were large-scale production units. The family farm producer is still very much in the picture, but hog producers also began to learn that they could protect their prices through two techniques. One, forward contracting, the other, supply management. Do you remember the NFO sow sell off in June of 1983? It was nothing like the retail margins, but we feel the hog producers of 1980s can survive because he's learning how to protect his cash flow through supply management and forward contracting. Merle Sunken and Kathy Morrison on prices in the pork industry. I'm Phil Allen for Here's Info, and that for today is something to think about. Number 75, 3, 2, 1. When Secretary of Agriculture John Block addressed the National Press Club, he was asked, campaigning for the presidency, Ronald Reagan said that he didn't know what parity was. In the intervening three years, has he learned? And incidentally, what is parity? Block said, you know, that's not surprising because it's a complicated process. You take a base period in history, and originally they took the period from 1910 to 14. They figured that if a bushel of corn would buy a pair of shoes then, a bushel of corn should still buy a pair of shoes. But if it doesn't buy a pair of shoes, you've lost ground on parity. If you can only buy one shoe with a bushel of corn, you're at 50% of parity today. And then Block said a lot of products are at only 50% of parity. He added, but agriculture is more efficient today. We have new technology. The farmer is raising more bushels. He has more to sell, so he is able to get both shoes. So that's why parity is not something that should stay the same all the time. And then Block concluded, because if it does, it doesn't take into account the productivity of the industry. John Block, in other words, is saying don't protect inefficiency. But the thing that goes unsaid about parity, it seems to me, is that there's an unfair standard. When any other business gets big and efficient, and has more to sell, we say, fine, it deserves to profit not only for the owners, but for all who work in that industry. But for agriculture, we say, well, since it's now more efficient, let's adjust its income down to no more than the original family size income. That's the way we think about public policy for farmers. They may have a farm capitalized at a million dollars, but their commodities should bring in only enough for one family's needs. That's a pair of shoes parody. I'm Phil Allen for Here's Info. And that for today is something to think about.